So I sat alone with my father while he died, and his breath became very rapid, and then suddenly it stopped. And he was out of breath and out of time. And he was 72 years old. But his decline started long before the heart attacks that took him. He had vascular dementia in his early 60s, and his razor-sharp mind had clearly fallen away, and he became very tense and uncomfortable for his latter years. So he lost, I think, around 15 years of potential lifespan, but he lost around 20 years of potential health span. So let's talk a little about that. So here's the mortality curve for 1925. 30% of people got over 70, approximately. Not too bad. Here's the current mortality curve. It's quite a lot better. People are getting up into the 80s and the 90s. Note, though, that infant mortality is a big change that's made things a lot better. But in fairness, we've stretched out in age as well. Smoking cessation, all the medications, medical procedures, many other factors have improved things. But it's my proposal that if we did or had all the right choices in nutrition and lifestyle, we could push the curve out to that green curve, get a lot of extra years. And if we make very bad choices, perhaps because we're misinformed, we can pull back to the red curve. Now, that's lifespan. But I'd really like to talk about health span, because there's no point living long if you can't enjoy life and be active and engage in life. So all the curves move back for health span or quality-adjusted life years. And it's important to note that the first part of our life, while it can be fun, we often bust our ass to put aside money and security to enjoy the future period, the retirement. I know I did, and still do. Smart pants like Mike Eads, of course, have all the knowledge and the wit to push right out to the green line, I've no doubt. And people like my father end up back more at the red line. And they might be very smart, which he was, but not have the knowledge or perhaps been misinformed and not quite made the right choices. What's to play for out in this zone that you may or may not access? Well, there's a retirement, there's golf, there's sport, if you're fit and healthy, reading, holidays, and you can get to watch the grandchildren grow up and maybe be part of their development. So there's a lot of important stuff out here to play for. What's the biggest issue that stops us accessing that great time? It's atherosclerosis, the degenerative disease of our arteries, inflammatory in nature, you see a young guy on the left there, the inner wall of their arteries are clean, no problems. The average middle-aged office worker, in contrast, will have the beginnings of atheroma, like pustules or boils growing in the inner wall of the artery. With time, if the person keeps driving this pro progressive disease, you'll get calcified plaque, and your body in its wisdom will bring in calcium to shore up and strengthen these weak areas, so they don't burst and kill you. But if you keep pushing progression, eventually you'll get ruptures, you'll get more vulnerable plaque, you'll get breakouts. They may be asymptomatic, you may not notice them. Your doc may think you're okay, but you're on a vector and it only has one end. And that's the big one, which takes it all away. But wouldn't it be great to go back 10 or 20 years in a time machine and actually see that you are calcifying and at massive risk building up in your future. And if you had the knowledge, right, and it's not easy to acquire, you could put in the root cause fixes, the right ones, to stabilize your disease process and stop progression. And we know this can be done. And your calcium would still stay there, but you would not keep pushing progression, and that's what really kills you. So you would stabilize the score and the disease. And you could actually avoid that heart attack or put it off for quite a long time. So let's talk about CAC score, the calcification scan, which is the master measure for cardiac disease. On the left there, we have a scan with a green circle, a lucky guy with no calcium whatsoever. And that's Dr. Jeff Gerber, because he's a smarty pants as well. 
On the right, we have a very different high-risk patient. You can see all the chalk in the red circle there in the coronary arteries, and this person has a massively higher risk than Jeff would have. It's a $100 test, non-invasive, best test you can do for the money and the incredible data it gives. I hear about radiation, right? Okay, well, I'm an engineer, I know about that stuff. It's less than one millisievert nowadays. And if you look up the Radiological Institute calculator for risk, that's around an extra one in 20,000 risk of a problem for this dose of radiation, which in engineering terms rounds off to zero. So I wouldn't worry too much about that one. It doesn't see the soft plaque. Well, that's not actually relevant if you understand this technology. The calcification shows the overall plaque burden, which represents the burden of soft plaque. And that's why it's such an incredible predictor of your future. And all astronauts and presidents must have this scan because they're important. You guys important? I'd like to think so. Here's one study, they all say the same thing, but it's a quickie one. People with a zero in middle age have a very low rate of heart attacks in the following 10 years. It's not zero, you still gotta watch your bloods, but very low. An intermediate score in the scan, you're maybe 10 times more likely. And a high score, maybe 20 to 25 times more likely to have a heart attack. Now this blows away the blood risk factors. I shouldn't even need to say it. A study I got a couple of weeks ago I liked, we can see here age categories. And of course, as you get older there, you have a much higher chance in the next 10 years of a heart attack. In fact, age is the biggest parameter for risk in the calculators they use to medicate people, much bigger than any other risk factor. You can see Framingham risk across the bottom. As you get older, you automatically become higher risk. That's why older people get auto-medicated. But let's forget about age and look at calcification results for these people in this study. And we see that a zero-scoring 80-year-old has the same 10-year risk as a zero-scoring 50-year-old. Same for intermediate scores and certainly the same for high scores. So it transcends age, calcification, transcends the other risk factors. I'll give you a different view a 50-year-old with an intermediate score has three or four times the risk in the next 10 years of a heart attack as an 80-year-old with a zero score. Fancy that. A 50-year-old with a high score has a massively higher risk in the following 10 years than an 80-year-old with a zero score. My boss, David Bobbitt, got this situation six years ago, and he got very angry, because he's a happening kind of guy, and he doesn't take anything lying down. And he found out he had a massive score, undiagnosed diabetes, and three blocked arteries, and no one in five years of executive medicals told him anything other than he was in fantastic shape. So he got very angry that the calcium scan was not available for everyone to save lives. And he put $4 million into Irish Heart Disease Awareness, who I work on behalf of, and our goal is to save people's lives through letting them know what's really happening inside. Is there hope? Of course there is. If you stop progression, you massively drop your risk. So here we have people with very high scores, a terrible outlook, and they have increased more than 15% per year over the years and they have a 50% rate of heart events. That's catastrophic, worse than Russian roulette. But similar people with similar very high score who achieved less than 15% increase per year. They slowed their progression like David did. They have a baseline background rate of heart attacks similar to a low-scoring person. So you just need to know how to do this. So why, what drives progression? Well, on the left, you see Western white men and the distribution of calcification by age. And as you can see, the worst 20, 10% of calcifiers at the back, where the red is, get massively calcified over the decades. In fact, the top 10% calcified people account for 40% of all heart events. And the lowest scores and zeros account for very few. But the Samane men, 
have no calcification and no heart disease. Striking comparison. And these indigenous populations, and the Catavans are the same, have basically no calcification. It hardly increases with age. It appears they're almost immune. And I'm going to show you some of the factors that would account for this. Note that the Semaine and the Catavans both have the same or higher LDL particle counts as the Western white man. So why? Why do they have no disease? Well, here's some things they have. They have very low insulin levels, very low glucose, no diabetic physiology, no medicine, no hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance syndrome. They have no hypertension. Their blood pressure doesn't rise with age, unlike everyone in the Western world. No central obesity, no TOFI, great omega-3 to omega-6 ratio in an all-natural diet. And I'm going to introduce this target list, which we're going to see in the coming slides. And this is just a rough list from me as to what's really important to avoid in order to achieve your retirement. Courting disaster. We'll take a leaf from the airline industry. And air crash investigations and disasters, there's many safety layers put in to stop them happening. So they're rare. And this is reason Swiss cheese model. And basically, all of the safety systems, if there's a small failure in each one, the trajectory of the accident can line up and get right through, and you have a disaster. If just one safety system was kept working fully, there's no disaster. And I, I like the model. What about cardiac disasters? Well, we've got the atherosclerosis trajectory. And it needs many factors lined up to allow it to give you a heart attack. If you fix a major factor, it's not a guarantee in a disease like atherosclerosis. You lower your chances for sure. But if it's this personal and it's your future, you'd want to fix several major factors from my list to get reasonable assurance that you've solved the problem. Of course, you can verify that with calcification. And again, these are the factors you want to be looking at and working on. And there might be some there that are missing that are notable. We'll talk about those shortly. So what about our friend cholesterol? Cholesterol has a part in heart disease. There is no question about it. But it's important that you keep cholesterol in perspective. So if we look at a high LDL particle count now and its potential trajectory to give you a heart attack, it is a substantial risk factor with pretty strong hazard ratios. And if you change your diet and your LDL particle count shoots up or any other inflammatory markers, you've got to make damn sure that you check that that's not a specific problem, that it's OK in your case. You can't assume anything. But the factors I'll choose which mediate or decide whether the LDL is a problem are listed here. I won't read them out because I'm going to go through each one in a small amount of detail, not too heavy. So here's your artery, and you've got your blood flowing there, and your LDL particles in purple flowing along. And the LDL theory is that these particles willy-nilly make their way into your artery wall. Thereupon, they can get trapped and oxidized and become part of the atherosclerotic milieu. And they will lead to an inflammatory cascade along with other factors. So this is a very simple theory, um, almost simplistic. But what's often missing in the narrative are the five layers that decide whether or not there is a problem. So I'll briefly go through those from research I did the latter part of last year. So layer zero, the zeroth layer I'm calling it, is oxidized LDLs in your bloodstream, in your plasma. And recent papers and experiments are suggesting that it's damage to the LDL in your blood that leads to mod minimally oxidized LDL, modified LDL, and that through LOX1 receptor is brought into the wall for clearance and can add to the atherosclerotic process. But you'll see native undamaged LDL particles in the green circle. Some teams and some data is suggesting do not really partake in a meaningful way. So you want to know if you have lots of particles, are they oxidized? That's the first thing. My little target list is a damn good list 
for things that will lead to oxidized LDL. So that's why we're going to keep seeing this list. Layer one, the glycocalyx. Now this is an exotic structure, extraordinary, that grows like hairs on the inside wall of your artery. And it has a sieving effect on LDLs, and it manages what accesses your arterial wall. Many components, it's highly complex. And here's a high def photo. They only discovered it 30 years ago. And the reason is when you take an artery out of someone, this is so delicate, it's gone before you can see it. So they know it's there now. Here's one of my many papers on it, and I'll quote the title. Arterial glycocalyx dysfunction is the first step in the atherothrombotic process. That's a pretty strong title for a paper, because most people think it's LDLs going in. But damage to this layer could be a very early initiating step. But we don't talk about it. We don't talk about the health of our glycocalyx. The papers and studies that show what does damage your glycocalyx with very significant impacts, high sugar sad diets, hypertension, oxidative stress, oxidized LDL, but not native LDL in experiments, smoking, of course, damages everything, and arterial morphology. So atherosclerosis is focal in nature. You can have a big atheroma just about to kill you, and right across the same artery nearby, the wall is in perfect health. And this and other teams are proposing that glycocalyx locally damaged is one of the reasons for the focal nature of atherosclerosis, among others. No surprises. Our target list excellently tallies with all those bad things I just showed you, which damage the glycocalyx. Endothelial cell, a single cell layer on the inside of your artery that manages the LDLs coming across into the wall and many other things. Basically, there's two ways for LDLs to come across the endothelial barrier. A there is transcytosis, and this is a highly complex process designed by evolution to move LDL from your blood into your arterial wall. It's a managed process, right? It's hard to imagine that process was designed to give you a heart attack, but there you go. B is paracellular transport, and that is simply when LDL kind of leak between the different cells and get through the tight junctions. Often when the endothelial cells are dying excessively and turning over, these tight junctions get looser and LDLs move across, diffuse across. The studies and papers showing what damages your endothelium and drives LDL across, C-reactive protein, everyone's familiar with that, oxidized LDL again, oxidant induction, reactive oxy oxygen species, lipo lipopolysaccharide from infections and leaky gut that causes an immune reaction, TNF-alpha, an old favorite. Any insult to the endothelial cells, pretty much. And what leads to a lot of these things happening, right? Go figure. This kind of stuff. Nearly there, proteoglycans are hair-like structures in your arterial wall. And here, LDL particles can get trapped, bound, and then get further oxidized and become a problem. So you'd want to know, well, what would drive particles to have an affinity and get trapped here much more? That would be a big deal. Well, from the literature, blood from heart attack patients, blood from insulin resistant patients, blood from type 2 diabetics, people with small, dense, oxidized LDL, LDL with higher APOC3 content, protein content, intimately tied to diabetes and other inflammatory conditions. And type 1 diabetic mice, I don't like mouse experiments, but here they had diabetic mice versus control, and they wanted to investigate exactly what I'm talking about. And they found that with the same level of cholesterol in the diabetic mice versus control, there was eight times more LDL bound to the proteoglycans. So it's telling us there's something way beyond the number of particles that's influencing this process. And for me, this list would cover a lot of it. Final one, magic HDL. All the low carbers love the high HDL. Think you're gonna live forever. Well, no. 
High HDL is a good indicator, but it doesn't speak to what's really going on. But I'll show you what does. HDL has an evolutionary crucial role to remove cholesterol from the wall that builds up there. And if it does it as quick as it's coming in, you don't have much of a problem. But if you're putting a lot in there and your HDL is screwed and you're not taking it out, you're going to get a buildup, right? It's basic mass transfer, mass balance. So this paper was fascinating, one of my favorites. And what they did is they took a whole load of people and they took their HDL, didn't just measure the concentration like the blood test, they actually measured the HDL functionality and how much cholesterol it could take out of atherosclerosis macrophage. So they found the health of each person's HDL and gave it a score. So when they looked at the future of these people tracked over many years, having a high HDL classic meant 35% lower heart attacks. And everyone's familiar with this. But when they looked at who had the heart attacks versus their HDL function, the health, there was a 70% lower future heart attacks for the people with the very functional HDL and a 90% lower stroke rate for the people with the functional HDL. So you'll hear sometimes, oh, HDL is only an association and the drugs didn't work. But that's all BS. This is the real story on HDL. How do you screw up your HDL if you really want to go in and mess it up and make it non-functional? It's pretty easy, actually. Just do some of this stuff, right? So we've got five layers here, and there are more, which decide whether LDL is relevant. And they're really important, these layers, as you can imagine. And this is a system. And with the problem of atherosclerosis in engineering, you look at the whole system, and you rack and stack the most important components, and you generally tackle all of them. But in our world, sadly, there's a somewhat myopic view staring in at LDL numbers or LDL attributes. Now, it's understandable. There are drugs which lower LDL, OxLDL, and other problematic small dense LDL, and they do improve outcomes. But I'll show you something from a very recent study. LDL lowering drugs in people with a high CAC score with demonstrated disease showed a lowering of events over 12 years, in fairness. So those drugs can help those people if they're not going to take other routes to fixing their problem. But in people with CAC zero and even up to 100, the drugs gave no benefits whatsoever. And there's large numbers of people in this state. So the 2018 guidelines, thankfully, have enshrined calcification scanning to make medication judgments on middle-risk people to actually find out whether they're going to benefit from meds or not. And that's a step forward. So the crux of the matter, we spent 50 years with the media and governments and everyone in health staring at cholesterol, still are, right, at the risk of not addressing the elephant in the room, far more rich causes, okay, in our target list. And inflammatory drivers, I put an asterisk on, because that includes many inflammatory diseases and autoimmune di diseases that rack up your, disease or your risk for heart attacks 10 times more than any other blood marker. So there's a lot of things in this list of, of real root causes. The irony is that these real root causes damage the layers that in turn allow cholesterol to get the kudos for heart disease, right? And the bigger irony is that the ultra-focus on cholesterol and fats has generated for 50 years these kinds of headlines. These are from the last couple of weeks because low-carb diets are seen to be threatening to raise fat, raise cholesterol. They're dangerous. This is the very latest, heart rhythm disorders. I haven't even read it yet, but I know what I'm going to see. Associational twaddle, I'm sure. And as Priyanka showed earlier, this farce fest, I mean, you couldn't make it up, but they did make it up because apparently one guy investigated and Barilla Pasta got a PR company to set this train in motion. So you wouldn't know whether to laugh or cry. The problem with this for all of us 
is that all of this media has a chilling effect on applying low carb or keto. And because the majority of our adult population are now essentially diabetic, we need low carb and keto to fix the real root causes or contribute greatly to a fix. And these people are standing in our way. So we'll just need to keep countering them. We'll get back to the quality adjusted life years. How do you push up to that green line? How do you get all the good stuff, right? The grandchildren, all that. Well, you target the most important root causes earlier in life, and you do due diligence. You have to take responsibility for your own health, right? We can give pointers, but these things, you focus on these things, and you resolve them. Low carb is an incredibly useful tool. It's not magic, but in the population disaster we currently have, it's a great tool. It will go a long way. With apologies to Dari, <laughs> I'd say eliminate industrial seed oils and processed foods, which have the triad, industrial seed oils, refined carbon sugars, three of the worst things for your future long-term health. So you get them out of the way. You get fish and healthy fats and omega-3, maybe cod liver oil, a lot of extra vitamins, nutrient-dense foods that have potassium, magnesium, K2, you know, all these things are very important for the proper functioning of the human machine. And you get healthy sun exposure. We were sold a line of BS about the sun. You get nitric oxide, you get vasodilation, you get vitamin D, you get other photo products generated in the sun that we're not even sure what they do. But we know evolution isn't an idiot. So they were made for a reason. You don't burn, but you get healthy sun. David Bobbitt, my boss, did all this and more, and he stopped his calc calcification advancing over the last five years. And I'm sure he's going to get himself well up to that green line, and he could have easily languished and disappeared down at the red line. My father was a super smart man, but he didn't have the knowledge that we have today. And also, there were massive amounts of misinformation all through the airwaves back in his time. He did have the advantage of having good, healthy meals. My mother was a great cook. He didn't smoke, and he hardly ever drank. And he was not over fat or obese by any means. Now, he had blood pressure in his 40s, so in retrospect, tofi, right? With the beginnings of diabetic dysfunction. On the negative side of the ledger, blood pressure, heart attack, fear, he always ate the margarine, banished the butter. The eggs and the other things were a fear, right? Whole grain, healthy whole grain for your heart, you're damn right. A lot of that went down. Classic food pyramid fare, generally, because that's what everyone was being told at the time, including him. And he would not really question his elders and betters in other fields. He was quite conservative in that way. And I'll acknowledge he had a taste for toffee sweets, and he would have eaten quite a few in his glove box on his long commute. So in fairness, sugar too would have got in there. But also in fairness, we were never told back then that sugar drove heart disease. It was just about teeth. So that was more misinforming. They were worried about eggs, not sugar. Bottom lines, middle age, middle risk, no brainer. Bloods, you gotta look at, but a calcium scan, if you're a middle risk person, for me is a no-brainer to check what's actually going on inside. If you're very low risk in your bloods, probably not needed, because if all of them are good, you're very low risk, maybe not needed. If you're high risk in your bloods, you don't need a scan because you need to take action anyway. But the middle risk majority, find out what's going on. If you're a low score, congratulations. You gotta keep an eye on your bloods. A low score is not a guarantee. You gotta make sure you watch out for ominous signs. You need to follow the rules. I didn't go through them here, I did a brief summary, but you follow the rules and six or seven years later, you get a quickie scan, just check, nothing untoward has gone wrong. If you get a high score, very different matter, especially if you're not expecting one. You know, if you're a very overweight smoker, get a high score, you just say, okay, I'm verifying the expected. But what if you're like David or millions of others who are slim and apparently fit and they don't smoke and they go in and they get a 400 and they find out they have a massive problem, you know, you got to look at a lot of blood markers then, and you need expert help to interpret those because you're looking for a special cause, not the usual one. 
Medications may be appropriate and a high score to stabilize disease in the short term at least until you work out what's going on. And you're going to have to really follow the rules if you have a high score because you're a high risk patient. You're going to have to move on down the Pareto. In other words, look at things beyond the usual good things we do because you've got a lot at stake, right? You have to take responsibility. And maybe two years later, you get a calcification scan because you need to know what your vector or your trajectory is. Have you slowed progression? Is it still going up? What have you missed? What do you need to do? And finally, I would say to middle-aged, middle-risk people, know your score, know what's going on inside, and take the personal responsibility to learn what the correct root cause actions are to secure your future and to make sure you do see the grandchildren grow up. Thank you.